everyone. This is Kathy. Um, good morning on my end. Probably good evening, good afternoon, depending upon what part of the world you're in. Um, I would uh, like to do a sound check. If you can hear my voice and see my screen, um, please, and see me, please type in yes into the question box um, to make sure that everything is good or if you're a BK member into the Ask Kathy room, just let me know that you can hear me. Uh, I'm gonna check to make sure that my audio is coming through. Yeah, my end, it all looks good. So if you can hear me, type in yes, wonderful. Thank you, Martin, for letting me know that this works. So we'll get started in um, just a minute. I'm uh, just checking to make sure that everything we have is in order. Um, and, you know, make sure the YouTube stream works well. Boris, do, are you there? Would you like to do a sound check and say hello as well? Yes, I am here. I'm going to get on camera just one second. Um, give me just one second. There we go. Hi, guys. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, oh, my camera needs to be just a little lower. There we go. Just want to adjust this a little bit. Um, I'm very, very excited. Now we only see your nose. Now you only see my nose. What's going on with that? Okay, maybe I need. To, oh, I need to raise it up. Sorry. Okay, that's better. That's better. Yes, okay, that's you guys perfect. Can, can see me. Okay. Um, hi guys. Hi, hi, hi. Yes, we are very ready, excited to get going. Just want to uh, make sure all the um, um, audio logistics and everything is done. Um, we have plenty of room for all your questions, for anything you guys have. We, we don't have anything scheduled right after this. We kind of blanked out the room, so everybody relax. Uh, we're not going to be in any rush. Um, the first question always everybody always asks, is this going to be recorded? And the answer is absolutely 100%. As long as you registered for the, um, for the event, which obviously if you're in the room you have, we'll be sending it out to you within probably about three hours of the, uh, of the event. So you're going to be able to see the full recording um, at any time at your leisure because it'll be archived just for your uh for your viewing pleasure so do not worry if you think you missed something or if you need to step away for a second you can always come back um and join us um other than that uh you know we are super excited this is going to be i think this is a very very unique uh event that we have never done before in terms of both product and and uh ideas so i hope you guys really really enjoy it and come share it with us um for all it's worth um we have, I think we're going to give it just a few more minutes because, you know, uh, the, we scheduled the event for early in the morning for some people, especially on the on the uh, East Coast here and, and definitely on the West Coast. It's really, really brutally early in the morning, so we're going to let it, people come straggling a little bit before we begin. Um, and uh, that's it. Okay, you want to say anything else? Um, and, you know, while we're talking, you know, we're going to be very focused on what we're saying, so feel free to type in your questions, either if you're coming through YouTube or if you're watching on um, go to type in your questions. We'll go back to the questions um, at you know certain parts of the uh, break to go through them. So make sure you get them in there. We won't miss them. It's just uh, we might not adjust them immediately because we are focused on um, what we want to share with you. Um, but yes, let's um, go ahead. We'll give it one more minute. And then um, we'll rock and roll. Just out of curiosity, where are you guys um, coming in from? Can you maybe drop into the YouTube chat or into um, the live stream? Tell us where you're coming from. You know, we would love to hear that. Um, we have, yeah, I'm sure they're Europeans. Yes, we have, you know, our Brits are always here, especially at this time of the day, um, <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's actually prime time for you, all of you. Yes. Um, lots of Brits here, which is great. Um, okay, Ecuador, you know, you're up early as well. Philippines, yeah, this is a perfect nighttime after work for our friends in Asia. William, you're up bright and early with us as well from New York. Um, hopefully you've got, I've got my coffee in hand. Hopefully you've got your coffee in I hand. I have my coffee. Let's all raise a cup of coffee here for everybody. And in hello, Malaysia, Australia, Nigeria, New Jersey. That's where, that's where, are you in New Jersey right now or New York? I don't know. Boris. I'm in Jersey. I'm in Jersey. Yay, Jersey, man. Yay, Jersey. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. California, been... you are a true trader, Stu. I mean, 
4 a.m. in California. This is the only reason why yes. I can't ever live in the West Coast because, um, you know, waking also, up. My, my, my Pomeranian is going to say hi to you guys, too, because he wants to be part of the show, of course, too. Yeah, waking up at 3, 4 a.m. is just too much for me. <laughs> Montreal. All right. Okay. So, hello, everyone, and, um, you know, welcome to our uh, our uh, webinar on markets and chaos, three simple steps to triple digit gains. And that's something that we'll want to share with all of you today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. And for those of you that are joining us later, um, as I said, this is um, going to be recorded and you know we'll um, send the replay afterwards. So um, let's start by talking about how this has been a monumental year. Um, it's almost you know, hard to remember, and it's certainly for many people, a distant memory, memory all of the um, issues that we had in the first half of 2023. I think, you know, especially the U.S. banking crisis, which was um, one of the biggest stories in um, the early part of the year. I mean, we had a banking crisis that really um, raised concerns about whether or not, you know, U.S. investments, uh, sorry, U.S savings accounts were safe and you know the federal reserve um as well as the treasury came in to reassure everyone that um their invest their um, bank accounts were secure but back in april um march april it certainly seemed like we could have a u.s banking crisis that could spill over to many corners of the globe and now as we sit um 10 almost 11 months um into the year and you know um seven months since the u.s banking crisis so much more has happened that the banking crisis is almost a distant memory for many people but the unfortunate thing is that a lot of the problems that um, plagued the market and plagued the world in the first half of 2023 is still here with us today to some degree to a large degree like for example the European energy crisis yes you know we were talking about this in the beginning of the of 2023 and how you know the colder winter with energy costs skyrocketing could really hurt um, the European uh, the euro area and regional growth as a whole now you know, oil prices, now we have a very different um, energy-driven crisis. And this energy-driven crisis could still pose a risk for European growth as well as U.S. growth and global growth. Now, right at this moment, oil prices are only at $83 a barrel, so no, they're not at the alarming rates that they um, could have been. But, you know, it could skyrocket at any time. Bringing back the European energy crisis, the global energy crisis, back into play. And the story here is that um, energy costs, Boris, do you mind muting yourself? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The story here is that, um, you know, energy costs and what people spend, particularly in the cooler and um, colder winter seasons, it takes a large component out of their discretionary spending, um, the discretionary spending funds, especially an environment where growth is slowing and a lot of um, people are beginning to feel the pain. Now, in terms of the U.S. banking crisis, yes, Americans are no longer worried about whether or not they're, they are going to, whether or not their um, cash and their bank accounts are secure. But U.S. banks face a very different crisis because over the past year, we've had aggressive interest rate hikes um, by many um, by US, by the Federal Reserve and also many other central banks around the world. And these aggressive interest rate hikes have um, significant ramifications for the property market, for mortgages, and we could see more defaults. We could we have and certainly could continue to see the commercial banking sectors of a lot of these um, of, of a lot of these banks report more losses. So overall, um, this is a situation where um, we could, you know, the U.S. banking crisis, while we're not in the same sort of panic mode that we were in in March, um, could still be a problem um, in the coming months as investors look at the earnings and the vulnerability of a lot of these um, banks. But in the next six months, 
there are um, specific issues, part of which um, are related to the, um, the problems that we had in the first half of the year. Part of it is unique issues that have developed over the past um, few months. Now, the issues that are related to um, what has been happening for many months is number one, we're certainly seeing slower global growth. Um, in, you know, in many corners of the world, the data is weakening already. In the US, um, the US is still reporting relatively um, solid, I wouldn't say solid, healthy, it's certainly better than um, data that's better than everyone else. But don't be mistaken, the data is still showing that um, it's just still showing that we are seeing slower US growth and slower global growth. Certain pockets of the world are slowing faster, like we're definitely seeing a quicker slowdown in um, the UK, you know, that's a very big problem. Um, a lot of UK data has been very weak. We're also seeing um, slowdown, um, a, a more entrenched slowdown in the Euro area. We're definitely seeing slowdown in China and um, the region as a whole, Australia. So the US is going to come along and it's just a matter of time because if you ask that any average American, we're definitely feeling the um, sell-off in stocks, the rise in um, interest rates, the um, uh, uh, uncertainty in the markets, and the higher yields start to affect the spending decisions of many Americans. And also, um, in October, many Americans are beginning to have to pay their, um, uh, or the Americans that still have student loans, are, be, are have to repay their student loan um, interest payments, you know, for three years. Um, due to COVID, um, student loan payments were frozen. So, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month they had as discretionary spending. But now they have to start to pay that money again. And um, that combined with all of the things uh, that are happening is going to pinch the pocketbooks of um, Americans. And, you know, that is going to lead to weaker U.S. growth, which could very well lead to weaker global growth. And higher interest rates um, obviously have significant ramifications as well, because, um, and I talk about this a lot, I talk about how um, the, you know, everyone's looking at U.S. 10-year yields and focusing on the 5% rate, you know, it really um, uh, hasn't bursted above 5%, it tested it, it's hold it below it, but the whole idea of higher interest rates is very problematic, because number one, what it means is that, you know, mortgage rates as well as credit card rates. Um, so if you're holding any sort of credit card debt, all the interest pay payments on those are, go are rising. And that's going to you know, affect the discretionary spending of a lot of investors. In addition to that, um, you know, the higher yield that we're seeing being offered on cash um, bank accounts competes with, um, uh, competes for investment dollars with um, the stock market. Because if you think about it, if you can make five and a half percent, that's what my bank is offering, five and a half percent on your savings account, you know, I'm going to have to be assured that I can make at least five and a half percent in my um, stock account in order to make this um, in order to make this trade worthwhile. And, you know, with all of the uncertainty and the geopolitical risks in the markets, many people are thinking, maybe I just want to go out to cash and earn this, you know, assured five and a half percent and not have to worry about, um, you know, the risk of being exposed to the market um, in general. So, you know, that's really what, you know, people are thinking about. That's really what um, is going to affect um, flow of capital and investment decisions going forward. And, you know, high interest rates is not just a problem in the U.S. It's a problem in many corners um, of the world. And then we have the geopolitical risks, which is really what's driven the markets in chaos. And really what um, we are here to talk about today, which is that, you know, we've got a lot of significant um, geopolitical risks ahead of us that could affect not just um, the uh, Forex market, but also stocks, gold and oil. And all of that will have ramifications on um, the Forex market and the markets, each market in general. So right now, you know, it seems like the world is on fire. We've got so many problems in different corners of the world, any of which could boil over. The, the, the world is currently engaged in, you know, uh, two wars, a war in Ukraine and Russia, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, the attack on Israel, the Palestinian um, humanitarian crisis, 
Um, and then on an economic perspective, we have the property bust in China, which we'll talk more about, rising interest rates, and a possibility of a um, invasion in Taiwan. So we're going to um, uh, talk about each of these and their potential impact on your investments and the financial markets. So starting off with um, the wars, the attack on, um, sorry, the Ukraine-Russia war has been happening um, for some time. It's um, started um, in the uh, winter of the beginning of the year and has persisted. And right now, you know, we thought that the Ukraine-Russia crisis was going to have a significant impact on oil, and it did at the time. But um, since then, you know, the market's completely shaken off the impact of the Ukraine-Russia crisis on oil, and also shifted its focus to the new uh, emerging, the new war between Israel and Hamas. So, you know, all of this um, is still something that um, the market is following very closely, but it also gives um, Russia an excuse to, um, it also gives Russia an excuse to refocus on um, the Ukraine without necessarily drawing the um, ire of the world. So um, I would definitely you know, keep an eye on that. Now, of course, you know, the Israel-Hamas conflict is the one that everyone is watching. And this is the one that could really, truly um, boil over because, you know, U.S. is an ally of Israel. Um, we have a lot of major players, you know, sharing their voices about the conflict, like Russia, which seems to be throwing a support um, behind Iran. Um, China, which is, you know, kind of a middle ground there, you know, ally, um, allied with Iran and Russia, but they're also trying to, um, uh, they're also trying to encourage, you know, some sort of ceasefire. But the real key here is, you know, this is, this is like boiling water that is about to boil over. And if it boils over, it could have a significant impact on the financial markets. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to chime in, if you want to come back to that slide, because I think this is um, the most important slide for all of us to understand. There are three or four critical variables to watch for that will determine whether this is going to be essentially simmering down or it could turn literally into the next Iran, uh, into Iraq war number three, or perhaps even a, a larger conflict. The specific things that are going on right now that I think of interest is overnight Israel bombed Syria because Syria is essentially a sponsor state of Hezbollah, which is sponsored by Iran. There is basically the next stage in this conflict is whether Hezbollah, Syria, and perhaps some other um, Arab actors are going to uh, join in a concerted effort to attack Israel. If they're going to try to open up a second front. If they do this, um, Israel is going to respond with all force. There will be um, no, at, at, at that point, there'll be absolutely no concern for any kind of humanitarian problems. They will be just simply bombing everything in sight, left, right, and center, because it'll be an existential problem for them. But more importantly, if Hezbollah, which just had a meeting with the leader of Hamas, apparently overnight, um, joins the fray. Remember, Hezbollah is a client of Iran. We have two, not one, but two carrier groups sitting in the East Mediterranean. Every military analyst that I read is saying to me that they are essentially war ready. This is not just simply an exercise in force. They are preparing for a possible attack. So how all of this could really spin out of the control is if Iran decides to get involved in this conflict, open up a second front against Israel in, in the north through Hezbollah, and U.S. then comes in to support the single greatest military and economic vulnerability that everybody is talking about is the fact that Iran has only one place in the whole uh, country where they're refining oil. This is one island. I forgot the name of the island. That will be the easiest and most cleanest target for U.S. warships to destroy. If you're going to destroy the whole refining capacity of Iran, oil, inflation, gold, everything just goes parabolic. And I think that's what we need to be watching for from obviously both geopolitical point of view and an economic point of view. It's really a question of whether uh, the mullahs are going to back off 
or they're going to actually exacerbate um, uh, the problem. Um, and, and then everybody else gets involved as the problem becomes much bigger. So I think it's this is really, really going to be the key. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to be watching this very carefully. Um, and a lot of it will depend on where things go. So the question is, how does this affect your investments? How does this affect the markets? First and foremost, I want you to take a look at this chart, which is the volatility chart um, that we typically see in a given year on a, a monthly basis. And you can see in this chart that the second half of the year, even without these wars, um, volatility tends to be on the rise. And that volatility tends to rise as we head into the second part of the year. Now, what's been really interesting throughout this conflict is that the VIX, which is the um, S&P 500's um, volatility index or the measure of volatility, um, has increased, but it hasn't increased significantly. Right now, the VIX is at about 19. And when we had the Ukraine, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the VIX was um, in the 20s, like 23, 24, 25. It spiked as high as 31. Right now, the VIX is at 19. This is, in some ways, um, has a greater risk of a global involvement, in some ways, than Ukraine and Russia. And yet the VIX is only at 19. So uh, I wouldn't say that this is a reflection of investors not being worried. I think that what this is a reflection of is, um, is people on the sidelines ready to, um, to sell or act in a more panicked way if this ends up boiling over. So the point I want to make is that VIX is low right now, which is why stocks um, are still managing to have positive days. Like today, right now, stock futures are up 55 points. Um, the stocks have obviously come down quite a bit um, in the past uh, in the past couple of months. But quite honestly, since the um, uh, Israel, since the Israel attack, stocks are not too far from where they were before. But you know, there's a significant risk that you know, first of all, on a seasonal basis, that volatility is going to spike. And that this is going to lead to a much more dramatic move in the markets. But right now it has not yet, which is why when it does, we could see those um, thousand point moves um, in the Dow, which will lead to um, one to three percent, which could lead to one to three percent move in currencies as well as um, commodities. Now, everyone is watching oil. When we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we actually had a, quite a dramatic movement in oil. Um, as you can see in this chart, this happened in um, late February. And at the time, oil prices were at about $90 um, a barrel. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine shot oil prices in a very short term basis, all the way up to $123 a barrel. And it basically hovered around there for about like two and a half months before you know the market became complacent um i guess came to terms that this was going to be a long invasion and realized that the impact on um on oil wasn't going to be long lasting and as a result um led to um the oil rally unwinding now with the israel attack right now oil prices are actually lower than when i screenshot this chart oil prices are 83 dollars a barrel so oil prices are $83 a barrel. The attack um, by Hamas um, is right around where my um, arrow is. And we did see a spike in oil, but not a material one. And once again, it's because investors are waiting. The VIX tells us that investors are waiting. The oil market tells us investors are waiting. And they're waiting to see if some of these things happen. What could drive oil to 100 to 140? Well, you know, what could drive oil to 100 to 140 is number one, sanctions enforcement. You know, basically, you've got the flags of Israel and Iran here. And it's really a question of um, how much of a um, involvement, active involvement, um, Iran will have. And also how much of a active um, punishment the world will have on Iran. You know, there's been... Um, for the past couple of years, the, the world, the U.S., mostly um, turned a blind eye um, on the sanctions in on Iran's oil flows. And, you know, over the past couple of months, we've actually seen 
um, before you know the Israel Hamas um, conflict. We've actually seen oil flow from um, Iran, oil shipments out of Iran increase, and this has helped keep um, a lid on um, oil prices. And the reason why the U.S. allowed that, you know, prior to this whole conflict, was because you know Saudi Arabia, Russia, OPEC basically cut production. And the U.S. did not want oil prices to spike with inflation being such a problem. And so they just let the oil flow out of Iran, despite the fact that, you know, they're supposed to have sanctions and they're supposed to limit the oil flow out of Iran. So, you know, if they enforce these sanctions and if they basically um, uh, force Iran to um, reduce its um, oil output, you know, that could lead to um, a spike in oil prices. It is estimated by some, you know, oil uh, market analysts that if Iran was to cut output by a million barrels a day, that could result um, due to just simply tougher sanctions or sanctions enforcement, that could drive oil to 140. Now, I think 140 just is probably a psychologically significant number, but it may be very, quite a far ways from now, but it could certainly drive oil up to 100, 100, and 10, and that's where it becomes much more of a panic for the financial markets, for central banks, and that's where um, it becomes an issue. So watch, so the first and easiest, and I wouldn't say easiest, but the first non-physical um, punishment of Iran that doesn't involve military force of any sort would be sanctions enforcement, that san enforcement of sanctions that in many ways are already in place. And that, um, could drive oil prices higher. Now, of course, it's a fine balance, right? Because um, number one, you know, the world, the U.S. doesn't necessarily want um, oil prices to spike in a in an inflationary environment of slowing growth, and it's also a fine balance because you know, at any point in time, um, if oil prices spike, you know, there could be strategic releases. OPEC um, could respond with maybe um, some um, increase in production. There are ways to offset that. Well, let me just chime in on that, because um, the thing that puts the U.S. In a, in a more vulnerable position now than even a year ago or two years ago is that quite a lot of the strategic reserve has been drained down. They're starting to buy it back up, but not nearly at a pace where they can be able to refill most of it. So really, excess capacity is going to have to come from Saudi Arabia. It's really this becomes a truly um, interesting chess match, because remember, Many people from a geopolitical point of view uh, thought that really this whole event was not essentially, this nothing to do in a way, in a way between Israel and Hamas, although there was tremendous individual tragedy on both sides of the, uh, of the story here. The story, the real story here is this is a war between Iran and US. Remember, Israel and Saudi Arabia were about to sign a historic peace treaty, which would have essentially eliminated any significant threat to Israel um, because it would have made peace with virtually every uh, major Arab power in the region. And this particular event was the key thing that completely truncated that thing. And it was clearly you know, uh, motivated by Iran. So the point being is that, yes, uh, there may be some ways for us to economically offset some of the uh, spike numbers, but I doubt that in the very near term, the market isn't going to really, really feel the turmoil. That having been said, I think the greatest irony of the whole thing is that while we're watching this whole conflict, maybe it's because it's not an irony, maybe because it's because Israel has not really gone into Gaza, maybe because we haven't seen a full engagement, um, oil has actually come down. Those of you who are looking at uh, gas prices, and I, you know, in Jersey here, where we're sort of the kings of low gas prices, gas prices have actually come down in the last two weeks. Um, and that's sort of ironic because nobody nobody would have thought that given the Middle East conflict. But it's early. That's the key thing that we're trying to tell you. All of these things are early. Everything could change on a dime. I need to be very, very prepared to react and act financially when uh, the variables are going to change. And so the second risk to oil is um, the Strait of Hormuz um, disturbance. Now, this um, is a very important uh, corner of the world for oil, mm -hmm. basically 20 percent or more than 20 percent of the world's uh, the oil that's consumed by the world goes through and transits through the Strait of Hormuz. And um, it's estimated that basically one, you know, that this stretch of water, which Iran has claimed as dominion, is really the main focus because it's kind of the energy artery for, um, for the oil market. So if Iran basically seeks to block um, this route, uh, it's going to have major implications, particularly for um, Europe, 
which gets a lot of the oil you know, through this um, channel. So, you know, that's something if there's any sort of disturbance there, either on a military basis or on a um, just a, them blocking it, that this could also be one right. of those things that sends oil skyrocketing higher. And um, just to add, one of our most ardent traders, one of the guys who I trade with every day, Richard, in our room, just posted this uh, very important piece of information. He did say that um, China has also dispatched, I think, three or four warships into um, into the uh, coast of Oman to basically, essentially, counteract U.S. presence. Now, having said this, I will tell you that the Chinese warships are not even a uh, you know a, a competitive comparison to U.S. warships, and will really not have any kind of a um, military impact. But they're clearly putting in a deterrent impact to make us perhaps think twice about any kind of military action the point is as we're talking about this you know we're saying uh, israel hamas iran us and china china being taiwan but china being um iran is actually the the i think the more interesting and the more dangerous geopolitical uh, touchstone that in other words you can even forget iran and have china get involved in this uh, on the back end and then it becomes a completely um you know crazy story as we go forward so at the end of the day, what we're saying is that the risk to oil depends upon how wide this conflict gets. And um, and it, there's a very, very high chance that um, there could be a wide impact. So what does that mean for you as an investor, as a trader? Well, first off, let's look at the long history of oil prices. And let's look at you know how all of this stuff, and we're not going to look at 1865 or 1890. <laughs> uh, that's you know that's that's a completely different world. But I think we should look at some of you know the more near-term um, impact um, on oil markets, particularly in the Middle East. If you look at, for example, um, the 1950s, where we had the um, Suez um, crisis, where 10% of the world's oil market was taken um, out of production. It led to a brief blip upwards in oil. And then in the 70s, um, we had you know, the Arab states institute embargoes against countries supporting Israel in the Yom Kippur War. This led to a huge spike in oil that persisted and then extended when Iran um, cut productions and exports. So when Iran gets involved, you can see that the spikes um, in the 70s, in, the, in 1988, um, becomes much larger um, on a um, on a scale basis, and when those large Middle East nations um, get involved, that it um, becomes a much more larger scale um, impacts. Now, what you can also see though is that these um, influences, for the most part, in oil, even just looking at it from a bird's eye perspective, do not last long. It is widely believed that that, that any type of conflict. Um, you know, with the hope that it is resolved quickly, um, does not have a long-term impact on oil prices. But oil prices are low right now, in my opinion. They're $83 a barrel, which I think is low, um, given the geopolitical risks. So in terms of what this means for your investments and trades, I think there's some definitely some um, upside opportunity in oil. I think that, you know, either on a hedge basis um, or, in the uh, or in a pure go long oil basis i think from both perspectives um oil has the opportunity oil looks like it has the opportunity to um go higher it looks like it's you know it looks like easily we can get up to 95 dollars a barrel at least um 10 dollars from where we are right now um as this as this conflict continues so it may not last as you see from the long history of oil prices but oftentimes these spikes can happen and be much larger than we anticipate. So I think, you know, oil prices, you know, anywhere between 82 to $84 a barrel is um, a, a bargain in some ways um, for oil. And I think in the near term, given all the risks, you can either look at it as a hedge or you can look at it as a pure um, pot, uh, bull, oil um, bull play. Now, oil also has significant ramifications for inflation. In this chart, oil is the blue line and the orange line is inflation. And just looking at it, you can see that oil, which is a blue line, leads the orange line. The oil, the blue line is moving before the orange line. So this is very, very important for the world because right now, um, in the next few months, we've got some pretty important, including this week, 
monetary policy announcements. This week, today, we have the Bank of Canada. Tomorrow, we have the European Central Bank. Next month, we've got, or end of the month, um, October 31st, November 1st, we have the Federal Reserve. And so they're going to be watching inflation. So right now, it's not so much of a concern. It's not as much of a concern because um, oil prices are at $83 a barrel. Inflation is coming down, as you see in the orange um, line. Um, but, you know, if you also look um what happens in the spike the spike right over here this was when we had um the this was when we had the uh, uh the ukraine russia invasion that this could easily drive a spike in oil prices so the central bank leaders will be very cautious because i think they're going to share my view that this is probably a low level of oil prices and that oil prices at any point in time could spike higher and they're not necessarily going to give up their overall inflation view. And also, if you think about it, take a look at this chart. We're here in inflation. This is five and a half percent. This is where they want inflation to be at. So we are still very, very high up in inflation. And it's going to be a long road from here down to anywhere in this region. Even if they say, OK, we're never going to get two percent and maybe we'll get three ish percent. This is a huge move down here. And given that the blue line is probably going to go up, there's a lot of risk. And that's yeah. why at the end of the month, the Federal Reserve is probably going to remain hawkish and they're going to leave the door open for tightening. And we could still see the ECB and a lot of central banks, you know, leave the door open for tightening because inflation, um, not only particularly in the U.S., not only has a lot of room before, to fall before it gets down to the region that the Federal Reserve is comfortable with, but there's also a lot of stuff that can happen in between here that can keep it up here or even drive it upwards so u.s dollar has been very strong dollar yen is knocking on the door of 150 again and the strength of the u.s dollar has played a very big role in how, how a lot of things have traded gold you know currencies um currencies oil so one of the main reasons why um the dollar has been so strong is because the federal reserve has um maintained its hawkishness and left the door open for tightening and i think they, that they have no choice but to continue to do so. And if that's the case, the dollar is probably not gonna give up its gains that much. And also, if we talk about how one of the parts of the world that is the most vulnerable to this whole um, conflict is Euro area because of their exposure and their um, uh, uh, reliance on oil from you know, the Middle East, that that is also going to keep pressure on Euro. And so, you know, I think euros obviously come down a lot. We've got the ECB meeting tomorrow, so you definitely don't want to be front running the ECB meeting. But I think that um, euro will continue to outperform, sorry, underperform some of its peers. And I think that there's a lot of downside risks um, to the euro itself. So I just want to chime in here and explain to people who may not be, you know, wonky into all the various econometric uh, data that we're looking at to understand why oil is so important as a story to inflation. Right now, if you look at everything else, inflation has actually really fallen off a cliff. Basically, before when we had the pandemic and the shutdown, we had something called the supply shock, where there was all the factories were closed and therefore people wanted goods and none of those goods were able to be produced because there was absolutely nobody working to produce them. Now, they're more, they not only are producing, they're producing them in excess, all the goods prices have gone down, even most of the services prices are starting to go down. However, this is the big however, the only input that companies cannot control is their energy input. And remember that energy is an input into literally every single human activity that we do. So if energy input goes up by 10, 20% in a matter of a, of a month or two uh, during, due, due to geopolitical crisis, it's inevitable that it creeps either into the profit margins or into the price levels overall. That is why oil is such an important factor. If you look at the 1970s and you strip away every piece of commentary, the only thing that mattered was the 1973 um, Israel, Yom Kippur War and the 1978 Iranian oil crisis. If you took away those two events, 1970s would not have had persistent inflation. It was those oil crises that brought the inflation, inflation would come down and come right back up, come down and come back up. And the greatest fear of policymakers is that we're in that situation where we are vulnerable to forces outside of our control. So that is why we're talking about this so much, so you can understand it in simple, clear terms. So in simple, clear terms, I would say that there's um, definitely, in my opinion, and I don't know if you share that, Boris, that there's definitely 
um, an upside opportunity in oil right now. And I think anywhere between 82 to $84 a barrel um, is probably a, a bargain level for oil. Unless, of course, suddenly the Israel-Hamas conflict clears up, then that's a different story. But, you know, as things look right now, oil looks like a good place to either hedge or, you know, look at it as an alternative investment. Then there's gold. So let's look at yeah. gold. You know, gold actually had a more dramatic reaction to um, the Israel conflict than oil, a more dramatic and a more durable um, uh, reaction to it. Because, you know, uh, prior to or right, right when Israel was attacked, gold was at 1820. Now, today, we're at 1974, so actually slightly higher than where this chart is. Back when we had the Ukraine war in February 2022, it was at like nine, sorry, 1890, and it shot up to 2060. There's definitely upside here from here up to 2060. Now, the challenge with gold, um, you know, gold is supposed to be the ultimate um, source of safety for safe haven. And um, you saw that when we had the Ukraine, um, Russia, uh, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But it's slightly different right now. And you're seeing, you know, you're not seeing as much of an extension as gold and gold as you would think. You would think that gold should be trading above $2,000 um, right now. And the problem for gold is that um, gold is, is, is boils back down to interest rates. Gold, gold um, has no interest rate. Um, there's no interest that you can earn on it. And, you know, you people are making, you know, good, especially in the U.S., they're making five and a half percent return um, on their investments. And a lot of the institutional money can go from one part of the world to another and and seek of these high interest rates. And so gold is also competing with cash. And that is making it difficult for gold to rally. Um, so that is also something that is holding it back. So I also prefer oil over gold because oil um, is more of a shock. And, you know, gold, I, I think I would prefer to buy gold on a dip, maybe up to if it goes down to 1940, 1950, uh, which is actually not too far from current levels. Um, I think that, you know, it's probably a better opportunity than um, because especially if we get, you know, some hawkishness from the Federal Reserve, um, gold could pull back because gold is priced in dollars. And if the U.S. dollar rallies, we could see a pullback in gold. Yeah, so hold on a second, Kate. Come back to gold, because I want to add a few things that are really gold. important. Um, so the key thing about gold, and Kay is absolutely right, gold is losing out because interest rates are at 5%. But the thing that very, very smart people are looking at, and the thing that you need to understand is that the narrative going forward with gold is going to be completely different. It's not going to trade on interest rate uh, results. The key thing with gold, and I had a I had a very very popular YouTube video that talked about what's what we need to look for for if gold is going to be a really really serious breakout. Um, the key thing with gold to understand is that once the narrative shifts from just a pure yield interest rate differential to sovereign debt problem, and let me explain to you what is going on right now. Two or three years ago, with interest rates at zero, U.S. could finance huge amounts of deficits at virtually no cost. Today, at 5.5% rates, we are paying more in debt service than we're paying for the Department of Defense. More than a trillion dollars of U.S. money is being spent by interest rate alone, interest debt service alone. That's a very, very difficult situation to be in for a long period of time. Um, it's made even more difficult by the fact that if interest rates go up higher, it just eats up more and more. So in other words, we're actually doing tremendously well as an economy. We're growing tremendously well. We're collecting lots and lots of tax revenue. The problem is a huge amount of that tax revenue is essentially being spent to pay off debt rather than to do any kind of productive investment by the government. So the really true big narrative story here is, and this is where everything kind of comes in, we have a massive military conflict. It requires massive fiscal spend. Interest rates continue to creep up to perhaps 7%. Our ability to service that debt now becomes $2 trillion a year, like a huge, huge slice. Imagine as a pizza slice, half the slice now goes to debt service. That creates such a sovereign debt crisis. It doesn't matter that interest rates go up. This is the key thing. 
the higher the interest rates go up, the higher gold goes up. It now trades on completely different dynamics from the ones that traded now because people will begin to believe that none of that money is good, that none of that, that interest, uh, that in, inflationary, that bonds are going to be inf deflated to basically nothing. That was the dynamic of the 70s, and we need to be watching that very, very carefully. When it comes to gold, it's certainly been an uptrend. We're going to show you, you know, our strategies have picked up that uptrend quite early, but the key thing you need to understand is if we start hitting all-time highs in gold above 2100, that will be flashing sign that gold is actually perhaps in the new bull market rather than just hitting yet another uh, top above the 2000. So I want everybody to understand to reorient their narrative away from just pure interest rates to the potential of sovereign debt crisis. That's really the story behind gold. Okay, and what's okay. interesting about this gold move from this chart here is that unlike oil, which um, shrugs off the movement um, sooner, the gold, uh, gold is a more durable move um, after some of these geopolitical conflicts. When investors realize that maybe the conflict persists or maybe this conflict leads to um, a slower growth in important pockets of the world. But if gold starts get, getting on the move and investors really get panicked, then the move in gold tends to be much more durable than the move in oil. So, you know, the strategy with gold is, you know, with gold, unlike oil, where I think it's kind of, you know, in bargain area, um, I think gold, you've got to watch your strategies, wait for a pullback, watch for it to flash a buy signal before getting in, because you can see even from this chart here, there's a lot of overhang resistance over here. This is a significant resistance level, 1980. Um, and I think it, it may end up finding resistance there and it could end up pulling back, especially in light of, you know, U.S. interest rates have are at five and a half percent. It's been a couple of years since it's been there. So this is definitely a, a strong competitor for um, investment capital. And it's not going to have um, the same. It may not have the same type of movement as it had in the, before. So what the strategy with gold is to wait for your strategy and some of the strategies that we'll teach you later um, to flash that buy signal rather than oil, which just looks like it's probably a bargain right now. So now stocks, what are the risks for stocks? The risks for stocks are higher inflation, are, are, are is a laundry list in some ways, you know, <laughs> but um, higher inflation, which is still going to persist. So everyone's talking about how inflation um, is starting to ease, but you remember that chart I showed you with the orange line. Yes, it's coming down, but it's got a long way to go before we get hit the comfort level of the Fed. And that's what you, what you need to put into perspective, which is that it's a long way to go before it becomes, before it is no longer considered high inflation. So high inflation um, crimps the pocketbooks of consumers, leads to weaker demand. And I think between the sell-off, the general sell-off in stocks, the fear that stocks could sell off even more, and the um, fact that inflation is high already, that could lead to weaker retail sales, weaker spending and weaker growth. And that also could take away one of the federal one of the Fed's strongest arguments for um, the strength of the economy, which is the labor market. In the last um, FOMC statement, or sorry, last time Powell spoke, um, which was last week, he did start to suggest that there's been some slowdown um, in the labor market. And so I think we could see higher unemployment and more uncertainty. There's a laundry list um, a risk for stocks that um, make that make it you know much more vulnerable than it is right now. I'm not going to pull up the stock chart right now, but if you did yourself, if you pulled up the Dow chart, you will see that there's a huge head and shoulders pattern on in the Dow, and the neckline is about 32,800, which is not too far um, from current levels. Um, so US 30 as well as the Dow, there's a huge head and shoulders neck with the neckline not far from current levels. So watch that because um, if the geopolitical risk boiled over, um, we have not gotten those thousand point moves yet, uh, one day moves yet in stocks, but we could very well get that again. At the end of the day though, you know, if you've learned anything about investments, um, and investing in the stock market is that eventually the markets always shrug it off. You know, this is all of the wars that we've had in history against the S&P 500. And you can see, yes, you know, there's some um, the hiccups and some of the hiccups are really big, like during the Afghanistan war, 
Um, but at the end of the day, um, the markets shrug it off. Um, but we're at very, very elevated levels in stocks right now. And I think that if you don't have, um, you should have some puts on. You should have some short um, market trades on to offset any long-term retirement investments that you have where you can't, that are not that flexible. You definitely should have some, and if you're trading, you, I mean, if you don't have access to puts or anything like that, you could also just trade US 30. Um, you know, we've got strategies and we're trading US 30 every single day. You could trade US 30 to kind of offset some of those um, losses because there's definitely more downside risk. Even though in the long term, you don't need to be too worried about your long term retirement investment portfolios. In the shorter term, there's a lot of, we're so elevated, there's a lot of downside risk that you should have puts or you should be trading the, you should be trading um, uh, US 30 um, to the up and downside to make back some of those losses. Um, in history, it is much smarter to buy the invasions than to sell it. I'm not sure if this is the case. I think that, you know, yes, you should be buying the invasion or the attack, but probably lower. Um, these are obviously uh, daily charts on a long-term basis, so they do, they do not encapsulate how long the move happens. But so, I def yeah, I was going to say the one the one thing that when you're looking at all of these charts where you're buying the invasion, the common factor in all of these charts is this was a single one-off event. In other words, U.S. against Iraq, U.S. against um, Vietnam, U.S. A Crimean crisis, Russia against war, U.S. against Afghanistan. It's a single actor event. Why this could be different, and this is why we're so you know concerned and watching everything, is if this becomes a multi-actor event. This this is this is where the by the invasion could, could blow up in your face. If this was just contained to Israel and Hamas, I would 100% say yes. But if the conflict widens to U.S., Iran, China, Russia, and everybody else jumping into the pot, it's a completely different chart than this one that's what you need to keep in mind as far as the narrative and context but i also want you to look at this chart very closely and each of these by the evasions there's a huge spike downward in the stocks before it bottoms out and i would argue that we have not had that huge spike downwards yet yes you know stocks are pretty much you know us 30 is pretty much um where it is at you know on uh uh, in the weekend of the invasion. I mean, the, on October 6th, which is the Friday before the invasion, um, the Dow was at, I'm just gonna look at the Dow because uh, I'm on the chart right now, is at 33,395. 33, and right now we're at 33,195. So really it's not that far from those levels. So we have not had that major spike downwards. And when we have that major spike downwards, um, there will be a point where it snaps back. You don't have to be the first one to buy. You never want to be the first one to buy because you never know how big that dip is going to be. Instead, you want to use your technical strategies to flash that first um, shift in sentiment, shift in momentum, shift in trend signal to put you into those buy trades. Because when we get that huge spike downwards and that snapback, you can see in every single case here that when the sentiment turns, and when the stock market turns, it becomes a very strong, durable turn. So the opportunity here right now is there's no opportunity aside from making sure you're hedged against bigger losses because we have not seen any of these. We have not seen this, the huge drop that we have seen in any of these charts yet. And so we need to see, and we probably will see that huge drop. And then, then you wait, so you hedge against that, by you know, either going short US 30 or buying puts or something like that, or using your strategies to, to, to keep a close um, trade on each of these, or you wait for the huge spike downwards, sentiment to turn upwards, and then you ride that very, very long-term, very um, extended recovery. So that's how, as a trader, I would approach the, all of this. And then last but not least, and certainly not least, mm -hmm. China. Um, and we haven't even gone to our strategies yet, so I'm really happy that all of you are so engaged and still sticking with us because it's just so much to talk about with the risks. Um, China, you know, China um, has a major property crisis. You know, Country Garden, um, which is one of the country's largest um, uh, 
largest property developers um, signaled their first default ever. And Evergrande, you know, which is also a major um, player in the property industry, faces asset liquidation. And the risk here, and what China is really trying to prevent, is the trickle down into the rest of the economy. We have already seen that Chinese property stocks have fallen to the lowest level since 2009. And, you know, this is, um, is um, something that is spreading across um, the, the banking sector and the industry. So Chinese property stocks have fallen to the lowest level since 2009. And the Chinese property sector, which was a huge contributor to um, GDP growth during the big boom times of China, is um, now going forward looking to looking is going to be dragging on GDP growth. So, in fact, in fact, the Chinese real estate sector is 25 percent of China's GDP. This is why it's the elephant in the room and everybody's concerned about it. It's not. It's so overwhelmingly large relative to any other industrialized country that the collapse in that sector is very, very um, damaging to the whole Chinese economy. And Country Garden and Evergrande are two of the four largest um, and biggest uh, developers in China. And they were the ones, with, I mean, Country Garden first is, is an elephant and kind of eclipses everyone else, but Evergrande is also a big player. And while, as Boris said, it basically constitutes 20% of Chinese GDP. The property market constitutes 80% of household wealth. 80% of household wealth in China is tied up in their homes. And when we have lower house values, that's going to lead to less spending. China right now is trying to support the housing market by lowering mortgage rates. But, you know, the Chinese, First of all, already you know skeptical of the property market and worried about their household values, and that a lot of the money is already tied up in household wealth, and, and they they don't want to come back in. The lowering the mortgage rates is not the effective way to um, to stimulate the economy and stimulate the property market. And focusing on stimulating the property market is um, is is not the right strategy because they need to focus on stimulating um, household wealth in order for them to order for households to feel like they are wealthy enough to buy a home again so there's a lot of risk because it could lead to lower house values and less spending but the greatest risk is that it could lead to social unrest um and there's, you know, there's a lot of um you know kind of i wouldn't say protests but a lot of small protests related to um the dissolution of some of these um uh property developers and that could lead to financial instability and we've seen with COVID, and i think a lot of chinese have seen how successful some of these protests could be. Um, this is the first time in you know decades that they've seen their protests actually lead to um, change in the government with COVID. And I think they're going to be much more willing to um, protest and much more um, possible that we could see social unrest and financial stability. So if we have social unrest, financial stability, and you know Chinese um, leading to Chinese banking issues as a result. If, if China finally reveals that these property losses are hurting their banks. All of that could pose a very big risk, not just for the Chinese markets, not just for the countries that are very exposed to China, like Australia and New Zealand, but also it could have, um, you know, it could spread to the rest of the world. It could be global contagion in the markets, because we all know Chinese a bit is a bit, China is a behemoth in the markets. And if their stock market crashes, it will be very difficult for European markets and U.S. markets to avoid crashing as well, even if it's an, it looks it's perceived as an isolated Chinese issue there still will be global contagion. And I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of risk there because I've watched a lot of videos of, you know, Chinese, um, of, the chi of Chinese people who have lost a lot of money um, on property, you know, threatening suicide. And like, you know, it, it really, you know, it really hurts. And, you know, and some of them just can't afford paying mortgages on shell homes, in addition to, you know, they're funding the general, you know, expenses. So social unrest, financial stability, you know, sharper sell-off in the Chinese markets if China does not come up with some strong fiscal stimulus that is beyond just lowering mortgage rates, encourage banks to do more, to, to have more flexible mortgage lending, that we could see significant risk to the Chinese markets leading to global contagion. And then, Boris, do you want to talk about Taiwan? Well, you know, Taiwan, of course, is always a um, hot spot in, in discussion of geopolitics. 
Um, it's very unclear, you know, uh, give, it, it, you can go both ways in a sense, you know, does China take advantage of all of this focus on the Middle East to, to, to strengthen its position in the South China Sea, or is it seeing that it really doesn't want to tangle with U.S. because at this point, if, if you're going to be committed, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, if we're going to commit to the Middle East, we'll commit our resources to protecting Taiwan as well. Hard to, to, to kind of gauge where this whole conflict goes, uh, but it's definitely boiling. They, and, and it's not just China. You have to remember that other uh, uh, members in the South China Sea, like especially Vietnam and Philippines, very much on pins and needles because China has been encroaching continuously and constantly um, expanding its line of influence, the sphere of influence in the South China Sea beyond the internationally recognized uh, lines. Um, it's, there have been a couple of incidents where the Chinese pilots have, have buzzed sort of very aggressively U.S. warships in, um, in a very threatening manner. Um, they clearly are trying to um, establish their military presence and control, but, you know, the Chinese are very patient. Um, they have a, a, you know, a point of view that could be much longer than ours. Um, I don't think this is, a, if I were to simply put a, you know, percentage bet on this, it's probably a 10% probability that anything happens in Taiwan at this point. There's also, by the way, quite a lot of a military conversation about the fact that even if China were to make a military move against Taiwan, it's unclear whether their army and navy are really battle tested to be able to to truly um, complete the um, uh, the capture of Taiwan because Taiwan is sort of very well armed and it you know it's it, it's not a situation where you just you have to sail a hundred hundred kilometers and you know to get there there's plenty of warning time there's plenty of ways to um to, to thwart this this attack it's not like you know it's next door but regardless um the i think the variables here is perhaps in some ways maybe have even receded you know because the focus is not so much on the other end of it and us the thing about people uh, that people don't quite understand is when us wakes up um it's military might when we go on military alert um that is not a time when you want to challenge our might, because that is when we have all of our best assets fully ready to engage. I mean, China's, you know, if, if China was going to make a, a move against Taiwan, it would be sometime when U.S. was completely un, um, uh, unaware or um, un incapable of actually, you know, rousing its military might. Now we have all of our assets in the sea. We can deploy those assets in, in a heartbeat into the South China Sea. So I think I would really actually put the chances down lower on this geopolitical risk. But even without a geopolitical risk, you're talking about the economic issues that are far more uh, immediate and much more important at this point. So we talked about gold. We've talked about oil. We've talked about stocks. What about the U.S. dollar? What's the outlook for the U.S. dollar? Well, you know, we have to talk about, you know, first and foremost, you know, what has driven the U.S. dollar as high as it has risen in the past couple months. Um, there's a whole bunch of things here. Number one, it's the um, overall uh, outperformance of U.S. data. You know, unlike other parts of the world, U.S. data has mostly surprised um, to the upside. We have mostly seen, you know, basically stronger labor market numbers, inflation, um, spending. You know, overall, they still remain higher than what a lot of economists has anticipated. And this is an older chart. You know, right now the dollar index is at 106.40, so we're kind of um, where the orange and the um, pink line is. So we're at 106.40. So, you know, U.S. data has been better than anticipated. The Federal Reserve um, is more hawkish than many of other central banks. And to some degree, the dollar is attracting um, safe haven flows. And U.S. interest rates, uh, U.S. yields continue to rise, driving investors into the greenback. So right now, if I pulled up the chart or you pulled up your chart yourself, we are actually trading above the yellow line. Um, and I'm looking at my chart right now. So overall, the dollar still remains in a very strong uptrend. We had a brief pullback. It's now back above it. And, um, you know, all of it obviously rests on um, the Federal Reserve meeting at the end of the month. We have U.S. GDP tomorrow. And it's most likely going to be good because all of the data that we've had has been good. And Q3 was, wasn't a bad, it was a pretty good quarter. Um, but it all rests in the Federal Reserve. And we talked earlier about how they still have plenty of reasons to leave the um, door open to additional tightening. So for now, the dollar, which is you know clearly you know, been in a strong uptrend and you know many will argue um, is quite overbought, still has room to the upside. You know, back in um, this 
the back in uh, October of last year, a year ago, the dollar index was trading at 114. So even at 106, we still have more room to rise if you know a lot of the factors that we talk about end up being into play. And the dollar index and the value of the dollar index is very important because gold is priced in dollars and the dollar index rallies, that's going to keep the lid on gold prices. Oil is priced in dollars. Um, stock market is also sensitive to dollar flows. So keep an eye on the dollar index. Right now, the uptrend's intact. But if the dollar index drops back below 10550, um, then we're going to have a much more significant um, if we drop that down to 105.50, it could go all the way down to 103.50 before it finds any meaningful support. In terms of a seasonality basis, you know, October, you know, has been is typically a very good month for dollar yen. And so far, it's been a very good month for dollar yen. The, um, the blue is the 10-year average of how dollar yen performs each month. The orange is how it performed on a five-year basis. November is actually, hands down, the best month of the entire year. For dollar yen so this story the seasonality supports not only dollar yen above 150 which is not too much of a stretch it's only 10 pips from here not only does it support dollar yen above 150 but it also supports um just a general you know a stronger rally in dollar yen in the month of november and then euro dollar um the uh november is is actually it's, it's kind of mixed. On a 10-year basis, it's one of the weakest months um, for the euro. On a five-year basis, it actually performs a bit of a wash. So the trade really is in dollar yen. So looking on a seasonality basis, looking at you know some of the factors that are happening, I think you know many people are wondering, you know, is dollar yen going to stop rallying? Unfortunately, you know, yields need to peak for that to happen. The Federal Reserve needs to turn um, dovish or less hawkish for that to happen. Um, a lot of things need to happen, but so far they haven't. There are a lot of risks um, facing the uh, U.S. dollar. You know, soar, soaring, bar, soaring borrowing costs is obviously a problem for the U.S. economy. We also could have, you know, commercial banking troubles, and um, we could still have a material deterioration in U.S. spending and labor data and a quicker decline in prices. But so far, aside from soaring borrowing costs, we have not seen two, three, and four really manifest themselves yet. These are risks. These are risks that are coming out, but they are not necessarily risks that we have seen um, really become front page headlines, um, front page business headlines yet. But watch for them because once they happen, you know that that snowball effect could have could um, could happen very quickly, leading to a very sharp sell off. In, um, in the dollar, as well as some uh, big moves in other markets. So what can you do? What can you do in, in a world where the markets in, are in chaos? What can you do to, um, what should you be doing and what can you be doing? Number one, you need to focus on protecting your trades and investments. So like I said, if you're invested in stocks, um, you should be looking at you know puts um, on the reverse. And you should also be looking at just trading US 30 and trying to make money from your trades um, to, to offset any losses that you may have. You can look to generate returns um, in some of the opportunities in oil that I talked about, or you know, looking at um, some of the longer term setups and basically trading around the losses that you may be having in your investment portfolios. But you can focus yourself on protecting your trades, generating returns, and keeping your profits. And part of the way to do so is to, um, is to learn three powerful strategies that we have for trading right. gold, Forex, US 30, and oil. These are strategies that we have designed to help you stay profitable in uncertain times. And you know, Boris is going to provide more detail on you know, how these strategies work. Yeah, so I, before we even talk a little bit about the strategies, the reason why we wanted to come to you was because, as you can see, it's a very uncertain world. Oh, hey, baby. Hi, sweetie. I see. Every every moment of life, there's always going to be new ideas, new things happening. So um, that's my point. My point is nothing is predictable in the markets. It's extraordinarily difficult to be an investor in this type of environment where it's just ripe with risks that literally 
everything could go down and therefore you will not have any protection from it. And you need control. As an investor, as a trader, you need control. That's the single greatest thing that you could do because the more control you have, the more control you have over your own fate, over your own a life over your own financial future. And that is what we really wanted to create. We wanted to create tools and strategies to give you the ultimate control in a world that's totally uncertain. And we created three very, very cool strategies, which we're gonna talk, walk you through, that trade gold, that trade oil, that trade equities, that trade Forex, which gives you enormous amount of power and flexibility to deploy um, your capital into a whole bunch of assets, both long and short. That's the beauty of it. It's completely immaterial whether things are going to go up or down. These strategies are designed to profit either way. And that is really, um, I think, sort of the essence of what we really wanted to share with you because we've spent a very, very long time working on these strategies and um, they have been performing extraordinarily well. So the first strategy that we'd like to share with you is a strategy called Thunderbolt, which is a strategy that we designed um, that trades primarily, uh, trades everything, but trades gold like there's no tomorrow. I mean, it has truly been an absolutely amazing breakout strategy. It's, it's a sort of a, a, a break. We, we created three different types of strategies. One was a breakout, one was a swing, one was a, a trend strategy. But this particular breakout strategy, because of the way we put the filters into it and because of the way we created some very unique um, uh, volatility filters inside of it, is an amazing return on gold. It's been 75% month to date. So at one single lot of gold, one single lot of gold, uh, $10,000 down produced $7,500 return. As you can see, these are the, um, the strategies on the TradingView charts. The, all of these strategies that we designed, by the way, are TradingView strategies that are proprietary and private. Nobody in the world can see them. Nobody in the world even knows they exist. And as you can see, these strategies are incredibly well designed. They tell you um, how much to risk, where the stops are, where the targets are. They show you exactly the entries and, and um, the exits. And you can see in, when it comes to with Thunderbolt, it's just been profit, 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 one occasional loss, profit, 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 profit. Uh, it's, been a, it's just been a monster in making money. And if you sort of believe that gold is just at the beginning rather than at the end of its uh, possible multi-year move, this thing is going to catch every one of these uh, moves tremendously. Um, it's been what three out of three wins gold in, in the last um, you know couple of a uh, couple of weeks. These are strategies, by the way, just to kind of give you an idea. Also designed exactly for the what I would call the casual trader investor. You know, most people, I'm sure most of you who are listening to us, just don't have the time to sit and watch every tick on the chart. You have real lives, you have actual jobs, you don't have any time to kind of follow this stuff super actively. But what you want to do is you want to participate intelligently on a casual basis and still be able to capture very, very large moves in a highly risk controlled manner. As you can see, every strategy has a stop and a target. That little red line at the bottom is actually the stop on all of these strategies. And so everything is risk controlled. Everything is risk defined in terms of how much size you want to trade. Um, and it shows you, you can literally see on all of these indicators how they performed before, how they're performing now. This allows you to completely modify them. And I'll show you in terms of control, as I said, control is sort of our dominant theme here. You can modify them any way you like. We are giving you our default best settings in these strategies, but there is a hundred different ways to slice this apple that can make you profits in, a, in, in very, very different ways. Um, and we have a whole course that, I'm, that I've uh, created around these strategies that allows you to, um, to explore all these different um, ideas. So that's strategy number one, Thunderbolt, tremendously powerful breakout strategy, really optimized for the gold market, which we think could be um, the, the sort of a, you know, hidden, hidden uh, gem going into 2024. So it'd be a perfect, perfect tool to trade that market. Well, I think Boris is actually being modest because if he showed you the live chart of gold um, using Thunderbolt, it actually had eight out of 11, the last, out of the last 11 trades, eight were winners. So this is just a snapshot because we want huh. to fit it onto the screen. But right. um, it's had eight out of 11 winners um, over the, the past couple of trades, which are much more 
significant odds than three out of three. And so it's, it is truly a very powerful way to trade gold. And he'll show you that at the very end, if you would yeah. like. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you the actual live charts and how these strategies are operating, and you'll you'll be able to see it. Um, so um, so that's one. Um, then our next. You can also use Thunderbolt to trade US 30, right, Boris? Right. Oh yes. Sorry. So you know, as I said, every one of these strategies um, is designed to trade the three primary asset classes, and of course, um, one of those strategies is really optimized to trade forex, which I, I know a lot of people absolutely love. Um, so yes, US 30, which is a very very volatile asset, as you can imagine. Also, this thing performed tremendously well on the US 30. It you know, created like, um, what is it, four, 400 pips on, um, on just one trade alone. Um, so you have, the, the cool thing about these strategies, they trade on a one hour chart. As you can see, the, the general tenor of the trade is about between three to five days. So therefore, they're, you know, they're not a kind of a thing where you, know, you have to come in every, in the instant the, the, the strategy triggers and uh, be, you know, snooze you lose. Um, and they go for multiple, multiple points. It's not a, you know, in my, in my day trading room, we trade for 20 points every single trade. This is not it. This is a much more meaningful, much larger, much bigger profits for people who, who really have a life, you know, who are not degenerate gamblers like I am, degenerate traders like we are, but who really want to be intelligent, intelligent um, traders in a world where um, there are very few good options um, as an investor. This is a time take control of your financial assets by having very intelligent strategies help you out. Yeah, Boris is going to set up his chart right now to show you how Thunderbolt is working in gold. Yeah. But um, we also have um, X-Trend, which um, trades Forex. It also trades Forex and gold, um, which I'll show you. But this one basically um, jumps on strong trends as um, they are emerging. And, you know, basically is one of our favorite swing trading strategies for capturing triple digit gains and over the past six months it has generated 90 percent accuracy in euro aussie which is unbelievable um now you have to be you have to be clear on which currencies you trade because this is a very trending strategy so it works best on um euro aussie euro dollar and pound dollar some of the most trending instruments but th this is the type of setups that it picks it basically has um, some bands that show you the buy zone. It kind of is a leverages off of my original Bollinger Band strategy for those of you that are familiar with it. But this is obviously a, a variation of it. So we have a buy zone, which is the green bands, and we have the sell zone, which is the um, short bands. So when it enters into the buy zone, that's when um, it triggers a, a buy signal. So in this right. case, it triggered a buy signal right over here in Euro Aussie. And then it's a long-term trade. It's a trade that you ended up holding for a couple of weeks. In this case, we made 141 pips in profits, and that was right before we hit a 270 pip profit. And these strategies are designed for either one-to-one -one or two-to-one risk and reward. So anything above 50% is profitable, and 70 to 80% is obviously very profitable. And this is how it worked on Euro Aussie, and this is how um, this is an example of a recent trade in Euro dollar where X trends, we dropped into the sell zone. Every single, what's really cool about these setups is that every single strategy comes with stops and targets um, and also tells you, you know, how much you should use based upon your account size of 10,000 units. And Boris, we left out that it can be set up and configured in your account to trade automatically. And Boris will show you how to do that. So yes, I was, I, I was, I was going to get, I was going to get to that part. It, uh, can be, it can be configured to automatically take the trades in your account. So um, you don't need to be watching it all the time. So here we have a sell signal and then a beautiful move lower as well. And if you wanna get information, you know, we got the QR code that you can scan um, on these slides and you can see. So really yeah. beautiful performance in Euro Aussie, really beautiful performance in Euro dollar and even better performance in gold. We've been all over gold talking about the opportunities in gold, but we also said with gold, it's different from oil, where you want to wait for your strategies to flash that buy or sell signal. You don't want to just jump in because gold has some other factors that could um, prevent it from rallying too much, like you know the competition with um, you know cash and the five percent um, U.S. interest rate. So strategies that you can use to identify gold opportunities include X Trend as well as Thunderbolt, because this is the the most recent chart in gold. And in this chart, nine out of 10 winners using X-Trend. These are the odds I like.
Of course, you know, past performance is not indicative of future results, but this is a lot of profit in a period when gold, you know, what really wasn't necessarily moving so much. You still could have used X trend to generate, you know, 23 points, 13 points, 45 points, pretty sizable moves in gold. And, um, and it can also be configured to trade automatically so that you don't um, need to be looking at your charts every single day to look for those trades. Um, so Boris, do you want to pull up Thunderbolt and yes. um, so, um, show them? I'm going to, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to take control of the screen for just a second to show you um, where is, oh, here we go. Just one second. Just bear with me. Okay, let's see if we are seeing audience view. Yes, we are. Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to get a little bit, I'm going to get a little bit larger because this is obviously so, um, you know, so many trades. What I want you to understand, this is Thunderbolt um, applied to, um, to, to apply to gold, you know, and obviously it performs very well. But what I, what I want everybody to kind of understand here is that these are not just indicators. These are actually live trading strategies with targets, stops that tell you exactly how much each trade has made. All of this has been programmed automatically. So you can actually go back and see, oh, wow, this is really, really trading well. This is, you know, this, the other one is maybe not trading so much. But more importantly, we talked about the idea of control. We talked about the idea of creating strategies that you yourself can live with, can like with. Um, all of this, all of these strategies give you full, to use a fancy word, granularity. Granularity means that every single part of this strategy can be configured to your liking. So, for example, if you wanted to do some kind of a, um, you know, if you were trading a $100,000 account and you wanted to have it um, automatically size your risk to whatever percentage terms. So, just for example, um, I want to trade a $10,000 account. It's defaulted to half a percent risk per account. But what if I wanted to be really aggressive and make it a 5% risk? I would say OK, and you will see automatically right over here, risk went from 0.50 lot to four and a half lots. It tells me exactly how much to risk on any given strategy, depending on what I tell it to do as far as my own risk control. What if I wanted to go and change my risk reward ratio to like, you know, I don't know, 1.2 just for argument's sake. Um, versus 1.1. How would that work out? And you can see here is it changes my risk reward ratio. What if I wanted to change? And this is this is really the um, the magic sauce. This is the magic sauce of what we created that cr makes all these strategies work so well. Because profits are easy, stops are hard. How do you set a stop? How do you create a stop? So what we created for all of these strategies is an organic volatility stop and i'm not going to you know get into too much details about how this works because when you if you come and you know trade with me i will explain all of this to you in full detail you really truly understand it but the magic of the whole thing is the stop is not fixed it's based upon the value of the breakout candle so if the breakout candle is very small the stop is going to be very small if the breakout candle is big the stop is going to be wider and then furthermore you can add and modify the stop any way you like it you can make you know by point 0.1 you see the stop expands or the stop contracts, whatever you want it to do. So this combination of great entry, volatility, stops, which is truly magical because I will tell you one thing. When you have volatility-based stops with these strategies, you don't even, we've run this, like where you don't even need to win 50%, right? Um, you don't even have to have a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio. You could have even a smaller one-to-one -one risk reward ratio. You're still going to make money. The reason why is because the trades that win have really big candles and even half a risk on a big candle offsets all the losses on the, on the small candle. That's the truly amazing part about these strategies that make them winners across all assets, across all market regimes, because they adapt dynamically dynamically to what the market is doing and trade with the market rather than trying to force to put to put your point of view on the market that's what makes it so cool so this is thunderbolt and as you can see it trades very very well on um excuse me i'm, I'm going to just uh go back to original settings because i don't want to mess this up so we had a point I'm going to take the screen and we'll switch back to our slides wait hold on don't you want to see the other strategy the uh the extra? switch back to the slides and you're going to talk about stallion okay Okay, so um, Stallion is, is actually a very, very interesting strategy. And um, 
can do a million different things about, about which if you come in, you know, into a mentorship with me, I will show you. But its primary value is that it can identify new trends and go for massive, just ma if you're looking for big triple digit, huge triple digit gains, this is a strategy that can do it because it's based upon the idea that momentum precedes price. A huge shift in momentum usually forecasts a big shift in price. And Kathy can show you on the slides here exactly how um, how that works. So this is an oil trade. Um, right, go ahead with the gold trade first. I, I sorry, or, or, or the gold trade. Either one, you can see this is like a 2% move. But if you were looking at this in terms of um, points, this is like a 40 point move in gold. This is really a massive, massive move in gold that it catches because the shift in momentum, you see the momentum went really, really down. That forecast uh, forward movement in price. It's a really interesting idea. Uses the same volatility principles to control our risk and to control everything going forward. Um, and um, this is a strategy, of course, you can see also that makes huge amounts of money uh, in in oil. Now, Kathy doesn't want me to tell you this because you know she doesn't really like this for for forex because she thinks you know it's a little bit too complicated. But trust me, if you come hang out with me in my room and I'll show you this thing traded properly and configured properly is like money in the bank in the Forex market in a very steady fashion. It's too complicated for me to explain right now, but it is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. You can literally take four or five Forex pairs, put this on on, on, on those pairs, and you just constantly make one or 2% a month on, on, on the strategy continuously. So it's really cool on that as well. Um, so you can do both things, be very, very steady, Eddie, or give you really big hits in the market. Either way, you can make, uh, you can make money with Stallion. So all of these strategies are designed, as you can see in our examples in the live charts, to be simple to understand. They are designed to help you quickly identify trades, which will help you prevent impulsiveness. Rather than just thinking, should I go long gold now? Should I go long US 30? Should I buy dollar yen? Use strategies that, um, that, that you know, have high accuracy to basically help you identify whether it's a good time to be in the trade. Wait for the setups, be patient, and that will help to uh, prevent impulsiveness and lead to better trading in high volatility environments. And the best part, and the reason why these strategies and are is so valuable is that we have actually created a way where you can have them all automatically be taken into your accounts. And Boris will show you exactly how to configure them. But this is the most valuable part of this um, of this program, which is that aside from learning three really cool strategies, getting the trading view indicators, and also being able to manually take the trade setups if you want, you could also just set up and configure them to do so automatically. If you just want to focus on gold, great. Just set up the alerts to do on gold if you don't want too much. If you want to do gold, but you can't really be watching US 30 or um, Euro Aussie, you can set that one to be traded automatically. That flexibility is up to you, but having the ability to just um, have those trades be taken automatically and what you and Boris will be doing is just checking in to make sure the strategies are continuing to work the way they should be, that everything is configured the right way is really the biggest um, uniqueness of this program because all the trading strategies that we've developed before, it's all manual. This is automatic and that is the coolest part of um, this program. Yes, and that's really, um, I think, the absolute trick. Modern technology has truly come a long way, and we've been able to take advantage of the latest cutting-edge technology in TradingView and MetaTrader to seamlessly connect these strategies into MetaTrader. So in other words, we have a signal on TradingView that you can configure yourself. You can make it high, wide, big, small, whatever you want, and I'll be happy. I'll work with you one-on-one -on -one to, 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 to help you configure the best strategy for, for your own risk profile and everything else. And it will trigger an alert in TradingView that will then automatically take a trade in MetaTrader. And don't worry about anything, because this is what makes this whole um, offering today very, very unique. We've always been sort of a trade idea generation shop. We've always been, here's our trades. You guys traded yourself, you know, go do your own thing. We realized that most traders need much more than that. They need not only great strategies, they need not only great trade ideas, and they need not only um, the proper technology to be able to execute them. They need somebody to hold their hand from point A 
to point B, to tell them exactly, step by step, individually, show them, how can I do this on my account? How can this happen? How can I see these trades happen? And I have a whole process. For the first time ever, people have been begging me for years to create a mentorship program, to create a, a program where I could mentor you as well as teach you how to trade. And this is the first time ever we have decided to be able, we, we have the technology now, we have the power, we have the ability to truly create a wonderful mentorship program. So that's what we wanted to talk to you about today. It's not just the strategies, it's not just amazing performance, it's the ability to come sit with me once a week and I will work with you to help you construct all of these strategies on your own account. When we first start out, we're not even gonna, you're not even gonna have to be uh, worried about your own uh, normal account. We'll construct them on a demo account. You'll see exactly how they work on a demo account for a week or two, and um, you'll see how well they're working. And then we, we'll, we'll transfer you over to small size, and then you can trade larger size. Or if you're really you know, advanced and you wanna just go from point one, we'll do it that way. Whatever you want, I'm going to mentor you to the best value that you wanna see. And we're going to do this for as long as need be. That's the beautiful thing. The strategy, the, this is a product that's not just a strategy product, but it's a full mentorship product. That's why I think it's going to be so valuable. We're going to sit there. We're going to auto trade this. We're going to review your results. We're going to help you become a much, much better trader with the help of all these cool tools. For the first time ever, technology makes it possible, and I really, really want to take advantage of it. I'm very excited about it. So um, that is what we're going to do. That's the uniqueness of this process, not just the beautiful winning strategies. These strategies... If you traded them all in combination since the beginning of September, took a $10,000 account and ran it up to $44,000, right? So clearly they are very, very good, but it doesn't mean much if you don't know how to use them. And that's going to be the key difference. I'm going to make sure that by the end of this mentorship, you will know perfectly how to use every one of these strategies yourself and give you the power to go out there and be able to trade it yourself for as long as you need be. That's going to be the key thing. So, um, so with you, our Gladiator strategy and auto trading package, what you'll be getting is you'll get lifetime access to the Stallion strategy. You'll get lifetime access to the Thunderbolt strategy for trading gold and US 30 and currencies. You'll get the lifetime access to our X-Trend Forex strategy for trading Euro, Pound, Euro, Aussie and gold. You'll also have three months of auto trading and coaching support mentoring program by Boris. The auto trading is also lifetime, but Boris will walk you through over the next three months how to set up and configure the auto trading, make sure it's working, and then have weekly check-ins to ensure that um, everything is working the way it should be. On top of the three months of weekly coaching, going through the trades, going through the strategies, we will also provide one year support for any questions that you may have related to um, the strategies, related to setups, or just if you want to chat markets. And as an extra bonus, um, we have 10 strategy master lessons and a MetaTraders Essentials course um, right. as a part of this entire Gladiator um, strategy and auto trading package. So, so the lot and the most valuable part, as I said, and the most unique thing about this is that we have never made these, many made any of our strategies auto tradable. And that, and especially with swing where, you know, they don't happen very often. And so you may not be watching all the time. And that's really what makes us so effective. And um, this is the way to, you know, stay profitable and make profits in an uncertain world using strategies that have high accuracy, you know, basically using strategies that can be auto traded. So you're not, you know, you may be working while there's a big volatility environment. Let the strategies do the work for you. Check in once a week, make sure that they are you're performing the way they are. And we will work you with you throughout the entire process. So it's an amazing program. Um, and, you know, we've got a very special offer that ends, you know, midnight this Sunday. And we really encourage you to take advantage of it because this is the one of the best swing trading products we've ever developed. It really is. And it's it's not just the swing trading product. It's the fact that we're going to walk you step by step. There's so many people, you know, we're used to working with kind of advanced intermediate traders who know all the tools, know everything, you know, how to trade, blah, blah, blah. We they kind of skip all the details. And I feel that we've basically left a lot of people behind who just are bewildered when they walk into these markets. One of the things that people are bewildered by is the MetaTrader itself. Like people don't even know how to trade MetaTrader uh, really well. 
I've created a step-by-step -step course that's going to just walk you right through the whole process. By the end of it, you're going to be a MetaTrader master, and I will help you all the way through in my live mentorship to make sure that everything is configured. The other thing that you know we've created with this thing is we've just scratched the the the, the barrel of the surface or whatever the, the the expression is in terms of the amount of strategies that they're, that are put there. I didn't even tell Kathy about this, but one of the secret um, chapters in the strategy master lessons is on the daily charts, which is ridiculous. I mean, you want to talk about some big ass trades, X trend on daily charts where, you know, the volatility is all built, built into the daily candle. Amazing, amazing abilities for those people that really want to trade some larger strategies. So there's just enormous amount of wealth of information from just the, the, the uh, stuff that we showed you to what's, uh, to what's available in these courses, plus the mentorship, all of it available. Now, there's people asking me, do you need to um, have a TradingView account to be able to trade this. Um, the thing about TradingView is that the initial TradingView is free and you could try all of this, like all the functionality can be available on TradingView for free. We can uh, add the indicator, we can add the alerts, all of that is totally available. If you wanna have the full plethora, of course, uh, you know, all the strategies, all the alerts, everything else, you definitely have to um, have a very small $15 a month TradingView account. But really, if you're going to be a trader in this world, um, it's almost de rigueur. It's, it's just assumed. Every, TradingView has 50 million uh, customers for a good reason, because nobody who trades in the market, if you ever look at any trading video on YouTube, it's always on TradingView. It's just, it's like a Bloomberg for retail customers. So, you know, yes, you don't have to pay anything for TradingView to be able to, 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 to experience this process, but it's definitely good to have what we call the, the basic TradingView account, which is a $15 a month pro account, and that will take care of everything that you need to do in order to be able to auto trade this continuously. So um, that's is there any other question? That's QR code um, for more details, um, and you can get a link to um, more information on you know what we offer. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to fire away. So we have one question right now about um, what is the um, impact on the property crisis in China on gold? That's a very good question. So. If you imagine, you know, right now, the property crisis is what it is right now. The, the real fear is that it spills over to social unrest as well as a banking crisis. And if that happens, um, we should get, we could get global contagion. And if we get global contagion, that is perceived as positive um, for gold. So that would be one of the factors that could drive gold sharply higher. But right now, you know, we have to see, you know, how much support China provides for the economy. Um, um, sorry, there's a couple, go ahead. Yeah, do you, any other question you want to take? Well, there's some questions about prop accounts, whether you can yeah. use this on I, a prop I, account. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna answer that. So, so there's a question here about, can this be traded for prop? And the answer is 1000% yes. I mean, these strategies are actually optimized for prop because they're such low risk strategies. There's strategies where you can configure 1% loss on these strategy. So there's almost very little uh, volatility in, in, in making the prop accounts viable. By the way, one of the things you will talk about in mentorship, because I will definitely discuss this, um, is, um, uh, sorry, just one second. Uh, uh, I will definitely discuss this, is um, how to take these strategies into various prop uh, programs and turn them into very viable ideas. One of the greatest things that's happened since we started doing this, um, I'm, uh, um, I'm sorry, I, just, I have a phone call in the middle of this. Um, one of the greatest things that's happened since we started doing all of this is um, prop has gone unlimited, meaning that there is no time limit to be able to trade this. And these are perfect strategies for a slow, steady prop funding account. They will grow nice and easy. They'll have a very, very good equity curve and they will have very little drawdown and they'll take a little time, but that time will be fruitful into essentially turning itself into a prop account. So do you want to trade it for your own account? Yes. Do you want to trade it for prop accounts? A thousand percent. I'm doing it for my own prop accounts as well as, uh, as my own accounts. Absolutely. Um, the other question we have here is VPS. Do you need a VPS? You can have one, but I have a trick. Um, if you have a, just an old computer, I will show you the tricks in my, in my room. I used to have lots of VPSs. I don't have a single VPS and I trade all of this 24 hours a day. I'll show you how to do this with, it. with no money whatsoever if you have a, just an old computer um, that you that you want to have. Or if you want to have a VPS, you can do it that way as well. So yes, the question is, we will. I will answer every question you have. I've done it. I have, I have it working. I have it working fully 
automatically. So when I tell you I'm gonna do my ment mentorship from A to Z, I mean it. There will be no question unanswered. There'll be no um, idea that you can't uh, tackle and there'll be no problem that we can't solve together. That's why I'm so excited about this. It's really a complete start to finish program to give you full complete control of trading. That's what's so exciting about it. So some um, other questions. Um, is 10-year yield still a good sentiment indicator in this environment? Um, it is to some degree. It's, it's more of an indicator of how the US dollar will trade than how stocks will trade. But so if you're trading Forex, it's still a good leading indicator for Forex, but less so for stocks. Also, another question, why is the Aussie falling with the um, stronger CPI report? This is actually a really important question because it explains why sometimes you have other currencies fall off of a, a stronger inflation report. And the reason for that is because, you know, inflation is bad, right? I mean, inflation is bad for the economy. It's bad for growth. And people fear that with the PMIs that we had earlier this week from Australia being weak, the inflation problem will exacerbate the trouble in um, in the economy. A poor question for you, Boris. Can we copy the trade to other trading platforms using the strategy? What do you mean by other trading platforms? Like it's other brokers, I guess, right? Well, if you're talking about other brokers, for sure. Like in other words, you can, you can, you yes. So if you want to do a copy trader, and there's some very, very good. I, I'll also have some very good resources for you for for copy trading. Um, so you want to have a master account that trades your strategy and you want to, you want to replicate it into, into let's say five prop accounts or five of your own other personal brokers, 100% can be, I am, I'm doing it right now. Yes. So the answer is 100% yes. Um, you can definitely copy trade it. So, um, I think we've answered most of your questions. And as we said, you know, we've never created an auto trading, um, program before. This is our very first one, which is why it's so valuable. And um, we've got this very special offer that ends Sunday after Sunday. It's not going to cost like this anymore. It's going to be significantly higher. So, um, you know, click on, you know, put your phone to that QR code, click on it, and, um, you know, we will uh, hope to see you in the mentorship and, and I will take you hand by hand. We've done two things we've never done, a full auto trader program and a mentorship program. Things have been begging for us forever. It's it never has been a time because technology has not been there. It's finally been there. It's now there to give you the power to be able to be a super trader. And I will be there to hold your hand. That's why I, I'm so, so excited. We have a question from Rocky. Is there any support after three months? You get one year of support after three months of live mentoring. And is there an alert generated from BK? The way this works is that you have the strategy and you set and you see those um, trades that were generated um, in the charts. Basically, yes. wait, that we're talking about yes. Uh, so the answer to that is yes are, and yes. I just want I just want the person to understand that the alerts that we generate can be both alerts that go directly to your email or go to your phone and just simply, you wanna trade it manually, it just pops up on your phone and says, hey, you got a trade in gold from, gold from Stallion. You wanna take it? Boom, boom, boom. You can take it manually. We even have a special MetaTrader tool for you to be able to take it so it automatically uh, puts the stops and targets for you and it does you know, just a single click tool that I already also included in the course that's gonna be part of the mentorship. Or, or and, in other words, it can give you the alert or if you add the functionality that I'm, gonna, that I'm gonna show you, you can also take the trade automatically for you. So either way, and many people are probably gonna wanna start with just alert. They just wanna see how this is going. They just wanna see maybe, I wanna see manually. No problem. That's what I'm trying to tell you is that we're gonna make it work to your comfort level. You wanna start slow, I'll start slow. You wanna start fast, we'll start fast. You wanna learn everything from scratch A? Yes, you wanna be a super, you know, super uh, uh, advanced trader? I will help you that way. That's the difference. It's going to be fully customized to give you total control over your own financial trading. That's the unique part of this. Uh, it's not a one size fits all. It's really, really uh, designed to help you and personalize this program for you. So thank you all for joining us for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> oh my God. Many of you stay till the very end. We are impressed. I hope we do enjoy this session. And um, you know, trading with us is fun. We you know talk a lot about you know taking all the ideas that we have shared today and turning them into um, trading opportunities. And we hope to have you as part of our mentorship program and our BK Traders community. And if you yeah, have any specific questions, you can always email um, Kathy at bktraders.com or Boris at bktraders.com. Uh, traders with an S at the end of it, and we'll be more than happy to answer them. Yes. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. You've been really wonderful for hanging out with us. We're very excited. Technology is here. Trade ideas are here. Support is here. We're ready to go. 
let's get trading guys. We'll see you in the markets.